young men get excited when you talk to them about responsibility? <laughs> yeah, fancy that, eh? Who would have ever guessed that? There's been this attempt to identify masculine competence and and power, let's say, but mostly competence with tyranny. As long as we individually are not hurting anyone, he's still a good guy, he's still a well-meaning guy, and the truth of the matter is we're not. Yeah, well, I did this series of biblical lectures in Toronto, and they concentrated on, you imagine this as an invitation to a lecture, okay, we're going to talk about the Old Testament, <laughs> we're going to talk about the Abrahamic stories, right, in a really dark way. I'm going to rent a theater, and I'm going to invite young men to come. It's like you think that's going to be successful. And we're going to talk about responsibility and truth. It's like, oh, they'll be beating down the doors to attend those lectures. And well, they all sold out. People have been fed this diet of pablum, rights and impulsive freedom for so long. Free tuition. Making quality child care affordable. You have a right to a living wage. There's a, just an absolute starvation for the other side of the story. There are no rights, technically speaking, without responsibilities. And all we've had for 60 years is a dialogue about rights. Well, that leaves a hole on the other side of the story. That, and it's a hole that, that's in people's hearts, essentially. Because responsibility, well, perhaps that's not more important than rights. Like I said, they're, they're part and parcel of the same formula. But it's in responsibility that most people find the meaning that sustains them through life. It's not in happiness. It's not an impulsive pleasure. Those things blow away at the first ill wind. But to adopt the responsibility for your own well-being and to try to put your family together and to try to serve your community and to try to seek for eternal truths and to live them, that's the sort of thing that can ground you in, in your life enough so that you can withstand the difficulty of life. And when you tell people that, especially when you include yourself in the audience, let's say, and you're not finger-waving from above, then everyone knows that it's true. There's been this attempt to identify masculine competence and, and power, let's say, but mostly competence with tyranny. The problem is toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity. And that's very, very hard on, on young men. It's also hard on young women, for that matter. But it's very helpful for people to hear that they should make themselves competent and dangerous and take their proper place in the world. Competent and dangerous? Mm -hmm. Why dangerous? Because it's the alternative to being weak. And weak is not good. The people who shoot up the high schools, they're weak. They're weak. How is it good to be dangerous? Because it makes you formidable. And life is a very difficult process. And it's not for, you're not prepared for it unless, unless you have the capacity for, to be dangerous. That doesn't mean that you should be cruel. It doesn't mean any of that. There's a statement in the New Testament, the meek shall inherit the earth. But the meek isn't well translated. It means something more like those who, those who have swords and know how to use them but keep them sheathed will inherit the world. That's a way better way of thinking about it. You have to be powerful and formidable and then peaceful in that order, right? And that's not the same as being naive and weak and harmless, which is what young men are being encouraged to be. It's like that's a very bad idea. It's a very bad idea because naive, weak, and harmless means that you can't withstand the tragedies of life, you can't bear any responsibility, you'll end up bitter. And when you get bitter, then you get dangerous. From Vox, <laughs> claimed, feminists have an unconscious wish for brutal male domination. You tell me why they line up with the Islamists. Because they line up with the Islamists, and not all do, they just haven't criticized them. Well, that's good enough for me. You know, you'd think if the if the feminists practiced what they'd preached, there'd be non-stop demonstrations against Saudi Arabia. You say compassion is a vice? If it's taken too far, you don't treat adult men as if they're infants. You don't divide the world into victim and oppressor, and then assume that all the moral virtues on the side of the so-called victims. It's an extension of the infant predator narrative, as far as I can tell. No, you're either an infant or a predator. Well, that's just not a good way of conceptualizing the political world. There's an entire, what, literature, psychoanalytic literature, on the dangers of overcompassion, hyperprotectiveness, helicopter parenting, all of that. When you have children, you have to encourage them. You have to encourage them to take risks because they have to grow up and take their place in the world. You can't protect them too much because if you do, you destroy them. That's the motif of Hansel and Gretel, right? Two kids lost in the woods. They find the gingerbread house. That's a little bit too good to be true. 
right? It's not only shelter when you need it, but it's candy. What lives inside the house that's too good to be true? The witch that devours you, right? That's excess compassion. So you don't want your mother to do everything for you. That's for sure. There's a rule if you're dealing with the elderly and like extended care homes, don't do anything for your clients that they can do themselves because you undermine their autonomy. And so there's a certain amount of harshness that goes along with that, just as there is if you're a good mother, because you have to separate yourself from your child and allow them to make hurtful mistakes, right? I mean, it's, it's very difficult if you're a compassionate person to stand back far enough to let your children take necessary risks. But one thing I'm not getting, there's a big difference between letting people do something for themselves and saying men should be dangerous. By dangerous, that implies I should be ready to threaten someone, to hurt somebody. No, you should be capable of it. But that doesn't mean you should use it. There's nothing to you otherwise. Like if you're not a formidable force, there's, not, there's no morality in your self-control. If you're incapable of violence, not being violent isn't a virtue. People who teach martial arts know this full well, right? If you learn a martial art, you learn to be dangerous, but simultaneously you learn to control it. Both of those come together. And the combination of that capacity for danger and the capacity for control is what brings about the virtue. Otherwise, you confuse weakness with, with moral virtue. I'm harmless, therefore I'm good. It's like, no, that isn't how it works. That isn't how it works at all. If you're harmless, you're just weak. And if you're weak, you're not going to be good. You can't be, because it takes strength to be good. It's very difficult to be good. Critics say, you men are already stronger than we. You abuse us, and you're encouraging that. Oh, well, that's definitely not the case. I mean, I've had tens of thousands of people write me now and say that, you know, they've taken my message to heart. They were nihilistic or addicted or aimless or having trouble in their relationships or not moving forward with their partners, their wives or girlfriends and they've been trying to develop a vision for their life and to take responsibility and to quit using deceit and they're better for it. And there's no downside to that for anyone, men and women alike. And most of the reason that men have been coming to my lectures is I think part of that's just an arbitrary baseline fluke. Almost all the people who watch YouTube are men. It's like 80%, 75, 80%, it's about the same for me. So it might be that my message is particularly attractive to young men, or it might just be that, you know, I was particularly popular on YouTube, and that's mostly a male domain. Yeah, it's popular with young men, because you're saying, yeah, go ahead, abuse women. <laughs> no, I've never said anything like that, and I think that that's... that's it's okay to absolutely. hate trans people. No, it's not okay particularly to hate anyone, maybe even your enemies. And, and my, what I've talked about has virtually nothing to do in any real technical sense with trans people. The stance I took on Bill C-16 was an anti-compelled speech stance, and I, I stand by, by it. Government. Absolutely. There has never been a piece of legislation in the history of the English common law that compelled private speech. Not once. There has been legislation that compelled commercial speech. So, for example, if you sell tobacco, you have to put a warning on the product. But that's commercial speech. It's very, very limited. And even that's been extraordinarily limited. The Supreme Court in the U.S. in the 1940s came out and stated forthrightly that there was to be no compelled speech uh, generated by the, legis by the legislative and the executive branches, that that was unconstitutional. And it violates English common law tradition. And the fact that it has to do with transgender people is virtually irrelevant. The issue is compelled speech. And if it wasn't the issue, this would have died away. All the scandals surrounding this would have died away 18 months ago. It's not what it's about. It's about the government and the ideologues that are pushing this sort of legislation, attempting to uh, exercise uh, tyrannical control over voluntary speech. And that's a no-go zone as far as I'm concerned.